after the break. The latest on the Dominic Raab bullying investigation. And we'll be live at the premiere of The Temptations musical. Tonight, is the Deputy Prime Minister a bully or not? Number 10 says they're considering the findings from a report into Dominic Raab's conduct. We've been in Surrey to see what his constituents make of it all. Lucky mistake. He's not bad. But bullying. Oh, I'm not into bullying. If someone's guilty, they need to pay the price. And if some of the things that he's accused of have uh, been doing, it's not on. Also ahead, the fly tipping furore on an estate in North London. The capital's hemorrhaging tourists. The mayor's calling for a change to passport rules and... My girl, my girl. I'll be joined live on the red carpet later by the founding member of The Temptations, who's going to be singing that much better than I can. Good evening. Dominic Raab's job as Deputy Prime Minister is in a precarious position tonight. Rishi Sunak is said to be carefully considering the findings of a report into allegations that his right-hand man is a bully. It's taken five months to investigate claims that Mr Raab bullied officials, claims that he denies, saying he always behaved professionally in the workplace. We should know tomorrow whether the report agrees or not. In his constituency of Isha and Walton, residents say... If he's found guilty, he has to go, as Carolyn Sim reports. It has been a safe Conservative seat for 120 years. But will Dominic Raab be the MP standing to secure Isha and Walton's blue wall at the next election? Have you always behaved professionally, Mr Raab? Allegations of bullying have followed the Justice Secretary around for months. Eight formal complaints have been made against him by at least 24 members of staff. But he has consistently denied any wrongdoing. I'm very confident I paid professionally throughout. I call for this inquiry, inquiry and of course I want to respect the integrity of it, which means not commenting on it to the media. No. It's an episode which has far from impressed voters here in Isha. If someone's guilty, they need to pay the price. And if some of the things that he's accused of uh, been doing, it's not on. I think in this country we need to take bullying seriously. It can affect people mentally. And um, the fact that, you know, um, people in high places in the civil service are prepared to resign if he's not um, taken out says a lot. So what do you think about your MP? I thought he was very, very good. And now this has all come out. And I just, like everyone else, very disappointed. It's all bad news, isn't it, you know? Rob's constituency is known as the gateway to Surrey. The Liberal Democrat candidate lost in 2019 by just under 3,000 votes. She thinks the area deserves better. Clearly, if it's found that Dominic Raab is a bully, then we need to find out who knew what when, and there needs to be um, a, an investigation on what the Prime Minister knew and why he was put in place. But as I say, for those six months under which he was in, under investigation for bullying, he should not be, have been in place as a minister. He should have been suspended pending investigation. Would you... Of course, in a few weeks' time, all eyes will be on Elmbridge Borough Council for the local elections on May the 4th. This is currently a residents' association Lib Dem coalition, and it will be up to voters to decide how this episode has affected the Conservative Party's image. The Prime Minister received the full report into the allegations several hours ago. He's now deciding whether or not Raab broke the ministerial code. We won't be told the outcome tonight which leaves an uncertain atmosphere both in Westminster and in Surrey. Carolyn Sim, ITV News. Nine people have been charged in connection with the murder of an 18-year-old two years ago. Abu Bakr Jr. Jar was found with knife wounds in Newham in April 2021. He'd also been shot and died at the scene. The suspects will appear in court in May. 
The John Lewis boss, Dame Sharon White, and Lord Simon Woolley have given blood at a new donor centre in East London to raise awareness of the urgent need for more black blood donors. NHS blood and transpo transplant data shows that only 1% of active blood donors in England are black. And traffic wardens in Westminster are set to strike on the day of the King's coronation in a dispute over pay and conditions. The GMB union says its members employed by the parking contractor NSL will be walking out on the 2nd, 4th and 6th of May. Kitchen cabinets, mattresses and personal posts. Just some of the items dumped outside flats in New Southgate in one of the worst cases of fly tipping ever recorded in the capital. Residents there have spent the last week watching hundreds of trucks dump litter on their street and told ICV News London that the job looked professional. As Rags Martel reports. All this used to be clear. But in a couple of days, piles of rubble have been dumped on the grounds of an abandoned care home. From above, the scale of the mess is shocking. This is thought to be one of the worst fly-tipping cases London has ever seen. So how long have you lived here? Donny um, Jones about, grew up in this yeah, flat. The view from the family kitchen yeah, this is, my childhood home, is so now it's... just mountains of rubbish. How quick did it all get dumped here? So this is a matter of days. They were bringing lorries fully loaded with rubbish to the site, dumping it and clearing off and bringing more stuff. As you can see, sort of household waste out there and all sorts of commercial bits and bobs, which is concerning in case there's materials like asbestos there or anything hazardous. And your mum lives here. Is she concerned about this? Yeah, I mean, she's concerned that this may encourage other fly tippers. You just hope they don't get away with it and feel that like it's OK to fly tip this amount of material in the area. Newland Housing Trust, who own the property, say the site was vacant, ready to be redeveloped into new homes. They've now reported the dumping to the police and the council, but it's thought the cost to clear all this up is more than £10,000. From her window, Rebecca Turbot saw many lorries dump their rubbish. People must think they're paying licensed waste carriers and then it ends up in a, a spot like that. And you think that people are making money from it? Absolutely. And I think they were charging for the, the waste carriers to come in to dump there. I saw many companies. When I googled the names of a couple, they were from Essex and places like that. So they had travelled to come here to dump their stuff. The site now has 24-hour security to stop any more dumping. But at the moment, the council and the police have no idea who is responsible. Rags Martel, ITV News. Enfield. Next tonight, it's a multi-billion pound industry that accounts for more than 10% of our GDP, but London's tourism sector is struggling. Hit hard by COVID lockdowns and the cost of living crisis, the capital's attractions desperately need foreign visitors back. But there's another hurdle. Since Brexit, those coming from the European Union can no longer travel here without a passport, a rule that the mayor says should be relaxed, as our political correspondent Simon Harris reports. London's tourist trade is about to get a welcome shot in the arm. The King's coronation in just over a fortnight will showcase London around the globe. The industry has had a tough three years. It's a complex world at the moment with Covid, with the change to our relationship with the EU and with the cost of living crisis. And It's hard to know which bits of that are having the bigger impact. London's many attractions have an enduring appeal. I love to see the palace. We love listening to the British accent. I think I loved Westminster Abbey. First time in London for these guys, right? But for tourists from Europe, like these Greek language students, there's now an extra cost. Well, everyone had to get a passport and um, that of course made it a, a lot more expensive. Before Brexit, hundreds of millions of EU citizens could use their national ID cards to travel to the UK, but not anymore. The UK is effectively saying, right, you can come to Britain, but you are going to have to go to the post office, pay 100 euros and get a passport. And a lot of them are saying, no thanks very much, we'll go to Paris or Barcelona or Berlin or Rome. In 2019, pre-Covid and pre-Brexit, tourist spending in London amounted to £18 billion a year. The industry is calling on ministers to rethink the entry rules. 
this is something that the government should absolutely consider doing a U-turn on. Uh, school groups, children's groups and English language learning is incredibly important to the UK tourism market uh, and making that as easy as possible for children and young people to come here is incredibly important, not just for that sector but for tourism more generally. Anyone else for the hop on hop off today? Rami has spent more than 20 years in the industry working on tourist buses. He's seen the highs and lows. The boom years I think were definitely the golden ones were between 2012 with the Olympics and 2014 and 15. And then it was a slight decline from 16, 17 and 18. Then uh, Covid completely decimated it. Overseas visitors are coming back, but China's strict Covid travel ban has only recently been relaxed. London's tourist industry isn't yet where it was. Simon, you're over at the uh, Late Debate studio for us tonight, aren't you? Um, can you tell us what's coming up on the show? Well, on the Late Debate, Charlene, we'll be asking whether the passport rule should now be relaxed to encourage more school parties from the EU to come to London. The government says national ID cards can easily be abused by criminal gangs and illegal migrants. To discuss it, I'm joined in the studio by the Westminster MP Nikki Aiken, Croydon MP Sarah Jones and Twickenham's Manira Wilson. We'll also talk about the Met and what it needs to do to earn the trust of Londoners. And are those controversial attack ads just part of the normal cut and thrust of politics? That's the late debate here on ITV1 after news at 10. Great. See you later, Simon. Thanks. This weekend, a test alert will go off on mobile phones across the UK to warn people about possible life-threatening situations. It's for a new public alert system that's been trialled by the government. Here's Sarah Colley with the details. A loud alarm will sound from millions of mobile phones across the UK, with a message also appearing on screens at 3pm this Sunday. It will say, this is a test of emergency alerts, a new UK government service that will warn you if there's a life-threatening emergency nearby. In a real emergency, follow the instructions in the alert to keep yourself and others safe. Visit gov.uk forward slash alerts for more information. This is a test. You do not need to take any action. The message will be received on 4G and 5G mobile phones, along with a sound like this for up to 10 seconds. It'll sound even if devices are on silent. Phone users will be prompted to swipe away the message or click OK on their home screen before being able to continue using their device. Drivers are advised not to look at or touch their phone until it is safe, just as when receiving any call or message. Oh, uh, still to come, climbing mountains for MND. We hear from the former firefighter who's just made it to Everest and... Tell you it was just my imagination We'll be live with one of the founding members of The Temptations as they prepare to bring Motown magic to the West End. But first, 30 years on from the murder of Stephen Lawrence, a new artwork's been unveiled in Greenwich to celebrate his life and legacy. It's been designed by pupils from Thomas Tallis School, who were the same age as Stephen when he was killed, as Daniel Henry reports. This is for Stephen. For everything he could have been, and for what his loss and legacy mean 30 years on. When you were designing this, how much did you know about Stephen Lawrence? I learned some of it from my mum and then other times when it's been like on the news. It just makes me feel really sad and like upset that someone would want to do that to someone, especially since he was so young. He had a lot of his life to live. The artwork is inspired by Stephen's ambition to become an architect. The students who helped create it weren't even alive when he was murdered. But they hope it will encourage people to stop and think about racism. It makes me feel kind of angry that there are some people in the world that don't understand that it doesn't really matter where you come from, what's the colour of your skin, like, we're all the same, like, we're all people. Even though it's been, like, 30 years, uh, yeah, um, it's just something, even though, like, we're anti racism ambassadors for our school and we did this whole mural, it's just something that we shouldn't have to be doing, as in, it should have been solved by now. Clive Efford was a local councillor back in 1993. 
He says the fight to tackle racism isn't over. We have racism in, in, in Eltham as there is in any community and people shouldn't feel somehow comfortable with the area that they live in thinking all the racism takes place somewhere else like Eltham. It's just completely not true. We had to deal with the issue of racism, that's what calling for the inquiry was about. And are you confident that that's what's been done? No, because I think that this is something we're going to have to constantly return to, which I think is why things like this are important. Locals who are seeing it for the first time seem to agree. Can we believe that it's 30 years already? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. This is only um, about, in everybody's head, it's like 10 years. 30 years that young man been killed. Do things like this really help? Yes, it does, because as I said, the children, when they come out, they might be out for lunch in a minute. They will have such a shock because it wasn't here this morning when I came in. This is brilliant to keep him alive. Daniel Henry, ITV News. Next to uh, a group whose songs have most definitely stood the test of time. Yeah, of course, we're talking about The Temptations because 31 of their Motown hits are coming to the West End in a new musical called Ain't Too Proud, which opens at the Prince Edward Theatre in Soho tonight. And Sharon Thomas is there for us now. And Sharon, you've got a very special guest with you, haven't you? I really have, but you know, I was just listening to you now playing My Girl and I was singing it all the way here as soon as I knew I was coming. It's a total earworm. So before I embarrass myself and sing any more of it, I must just say how many Temptations hits that we all know, Just My Imagination and so many more. I'm not going to embarrass myself any further, but here's the legend that has made most of them famous, Otis, welcome. How does it feel having your story come to the London stage? Well, like I said earlier, I'm like a kid that's coming down the stairs on this Christmas uh, day and I'm seeing all these wonderful presents and whatever. That's the way it's uh, making the little boy in me surface. So it's a wonderful feeling because I never would imagine that I would be experiencing that. Uh, it's a pretty gritty tale though, isn't it? I mean, oh, you were born in Texas, yeah. grew up in Detroit. Yeah. It's a tale of fallings out and divorce yeah. and bereavement. Yeah. How yeah. hard is it to see that? I've gotten, well, I'm going to say I've gotten used to it, but it is something to still comprehend that I lived through that. I mean, I lost my son and went and lost members and ups and downs, drugs involved, aside from the hits. So it's a story of death. You know, it's not just all about the gaiety of music. You know, so I'm happy that my story is so interesting that it has touched the human spirit. Like, I can see that. I didn't know that the chance went through that. And we're part of the Motown uh, history, you know, so wonderful ride. There are so many jukebox musicals, as they're called now in London. We've got Tina, Thriller, we've got, we've got Rocky coming back. How important is a genre like this in terms of bringing music like yours to a whole new generation? Oh, it's very important, you know, because hip hop has uh, been on the scene for 50 years, you know, and the music that was made preceding uh, hip hop, uh, that music will forever be around based on the thing of, see, when you can sing a song like, okay, I've got sunshine on a cloudy day when it's cold outside, and that can happen to me. We all know that see, one. It's got melody, yeah, yeah, you know, it's got melody. Yeah, and and any time a young man bring his about four or five-year-old son to see the show, and he's playing with his car, but he's singing My Girl, he said, I'm teaching my son great music now. That's amazing. Yeah. Now, I hope you don't mind me saying, you're the same age as my dad, 81, who is absolutely not performing on stage anymore. Right. Uh, you are, you're here in London back in October touring. Yes. What's the secret? You've been going since 1960. Well, first of all, I'm blessed to be able to do something that I love doing. You know, everybody can say that. You know, I've been doing, God has blessed me to be doing this for 61 years and I'm 81 years old. So like I tell people, I'm going to ride the hell off the horse. When I get off the horse, it's going to be bald. That's a lot of riding. <laughs> and how is it being back here in London? I would say in the sunshine, but it started raining about half an hour ago. Let me so tell you, I you was, were saying you associate London with rain. Oh, I love London. I can live here. And I'm not just saying it because we've been coming to uh, England since 1964. And one of the things that I learned about England uh, and 
the, the style. See, I'm a, I'm a clothes horse. So when I came over here and I saw how they were dressed, the punctuation line, the line of pills, and the, I came back to Detroit and said, we late. You got to go over to England <laughs> and uh, the other countries. Favorite Temptation song? Must be difficult. No, it's not. My girl. My girl. I got sunshine on a cloudy, on a cloudy day. day. <laughs> Otis, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Uh -huh. And the show opens tonight. It's going to be awesome. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. You're welcome. Thanks very, thanks very thank much, Sharon. It's been an amazing show, I'm sure. And uh, now, a former London firefighter with motor neurone disease has made it to Everest Base Camp after an 11-day trek through Nepal. John Chart and his team, the so-called Pilgrim Bandits, have done it to raise awareness and support for the condition. Today, John said it's the hardest thing he's ever done. He's been speaking to Antoine Allen. It takes a lot of determination to take on the world's tallest mountain. John Chart, who suffers from motor neuron disease, had extra special motivation to reach Mount Everest base camp. Uh, emotional, very, very emotional. I thought of all those poor people with MND that are lying in their beds and can't talk, can't move, can't tell their loved ones that they love them. And that's what spurred me on. John conquered Everest after an 11-day trek through Nepal, alongside military and blue light veterans, amputees and other MND sufferers. It's, uh, it's exhausting. Hardest thing we've ever done. We've, we've completed our expedition. We, we got to base camp. Um, I believe we've broken a few world records in doing so. MND transformed John from a powerlifting fireman to a person unable to use their arms but it could not rid him of his drive to raise awareness about MND at any cost. My goal was to raise as much awareness as possible for this, uh, this underfunded disease. It's a heinous disease. It's classed as the worst diagnosis in the world. Um, there's no cure for it. There's not enough funding. So it's left to poor working class people like me to go and do their best raising awareness and taking on ridiculous challenges. John was supported on this climb in fundraising by military charity Pilgrim Bandit. They have backed me, they have supported me, they love me, they care for me. You know, we're, we're, we're one family, we might all be different names, we might have different names and different mums and dads, but we're one family. John's fundraising missions have taken him to the skies to fearlessly jump out of a plane. He knows MND is shortening his life, but he won't be stopped from helping others. If you wanted the public to know one thing about MND, what would it be? MND is not incurable, it's underfunded. There's not enough of us with MND. Uh, we, we need help. John's next mission is simply to get some rest and return home to his family in Penge. Antoine Allen, ITV News. Oh, huge congrats, John. OK, that's it from us. It was lovely sunshine today, but as you found out earlier, it's now raining outside. So what about tomorrow? Here's Philippa. ITV London Weekday Weather is sponsored by Octopus Electric Vehicles. Car, charger and energy. Hello there. Well, despite plenty of sunshine initially today, we have started to see a bit more cloud feeding in now. And actually through the next few days, it stays fairly changeable, certainly more in the way of cloud on the scene, showers or longer spells of rain, and with that feeling a little bit on the cool side. And it's all very much down to low pressure. It'll be with us through the next few days, feeding frontal systems our way, those fronts bringing bands of rain interspersed with sunshine and showers. And out there at the moment, as I said, we're already seeing a bit more cloud feeding in from the east as we head through this evening that will be accompanied by a scattering of showers some of those showers possibly on the heavy side maybe a bit of hail perhaps even the odd rumble of thunder and then later in the night something a bit more persistent in the way of rain starts to sneak in from the east as well but for all of us it will be a frost free night temperatures for many hovering between five and seven degrees celsius tomorrow morning then not the sunshine we had this morning we'll have cloudy skies and a fairly persistent area of rain for a time but as the rain works its way westwards that will then be followed by a mixture of sunny spells and showers. Some of those showers once again on the heavier side and even in the best of the brightness, temperatures well down on today's values, probably peaking at just 12 or 13 degrees. So a bit of an unsettled end to the working week and that really sets the tone as we head into the weekend. Overnight into Saturday, a spell of drier weather, but you'll notice fronts never too far away and those will head our way as the weekend wears on. But how is it looking for the big race on Sunday? Well, whether you're running or spectating, it looks pretty 
promising initially, quite a bit of cloud, a little on the fresh side later on though, an increasing risk of a bit of rain. ITV London Weekday Weather is sponsored by Octopus Electric Vehicles. Well, that's it from us. Mary's up next with the ITV Evening News. But for me and the rest of the London team, enjoy your evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>